I've got a background working in other kind of campaigns in London and it was around the build up to Paris that I kind of said, well, none of that is going to be relevant if we're fucked with what's going on with the climate. When you're dealing with entrenched power, um, you need the force of mass participation, civil disobedience. You know, the strategy at the beginning was these mass moments of civil disobedience, but often before those events, we have these kind of like taboo actions or you could just call them sort of like but they're just a bit they're a bit silly you know we're really standing on the shoulders of giants you know gandhi and martin luther king and many of the civil resistance episodes in the global south Well, I'd just like to acknowledge that this conversation is happening on stolen land. I'm on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Others of you are all around Australia and even in other countries. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to First Nations elders, past, present and emerging, and welcome any First Nation people who are on this call. I'd also like to acknowledge that we are living in dire and desperate times, that we're in a climate and ecological emergency as well as the pandemic emergency, and that we're at the start of a series of rolling crises, rolling emergencies for which there's no other remedy but the strongest possible emergency action. So with us today, as I said clumsily at the start, we've got Roger Hallam. Um, author of this magnificent strategic guide, Common Sense for the 21st Century, which you can download for free or, or buy in a lovely book like this. But one of the great minds behind Extinction Rebellion, obviously, I imagine you all know him. Um, Liam, having just fumbled your name already, do you want to just introduce yourself? Because Liam is also one of the great minds behind both the April and October waves of rebellion in the UK and in, involved in the artistic side of it as well as the general organising but just help me with your introduction Liam. Hi, hi I'm Liam Geary Bolch and yeah I'm one of the people that helped launch Extinction Rebellion um, working on some of the projects with Roger and rising up before XR and yeah my time in XR has been mostly focused on the um, mass national actions um yeah and bringing a lot of creativity to the action design um yeah so i'll talk more about that later right so we're going to try and do sort of a great historic arc from the start of that extinction rebellion coming out of rising up through april through october through mass mobilization as it's proceeding still in the uk right through to the present um all in an hour um, maybe with a few questions interspersed, um, and then have a longer question time at the end, half an hour at least, and maybe the option to stay longer if people are keen, um, but also the option to go and have your dinner at 7.30 if that's the main thing you're feeling like. So um, maybe, Roger, if you would start just with some of that early background, some of the things that happened right at the start, some of your thinking right at the start, the start, um, when you created the Extinction Rebellion along with others in the UK there. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jane. Uh, can you hear me okay and everything? Hopefully you can. Yeah, I just want to start by thanking everyone for coming on, a call, on the call today. And you know, it's a great honor to talk to you all. Um, I think me and Liam, Liam want to make clear that as always really with Extinction Rebellion, we're not talking on behalf of the organization or you know extinction rebellion in any grand way we're just talking uh from our own experience so what we're going to be sharing is our own views for what it's worth um i just also want to make clear that 
I'm not sure our minds are that great. <laughs> and um, I think the, the first thing to say is that if you want to be successful at what we do, uh, really, I think the skill set is attention to detail and persistence. You know, we're really standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, Gandhi and Martin Luther King and many of the civil resistance episodes in the global south. So I think it's important to acknowledge that we're not massive innovators here. We didn't wake up one morning with the idea of a rebellion. You know, there's lots of examples of it. And, and secondly, I guess I always like to say that what we're going to say and advise and what have you is only like the best bet. There's no absolute guarantees that what we suggest is going to work. You know, society and social processes are very complicated. But the main point is that uh, this is our, our best our best option. That's our argument, um, uh, you know, compared with, you know, sending emails and all that routine. So, you know, that sort of sets the scene. Um, in terms of the background, well, I'm presuming our people broadly know it, so I won't go on that long. But myself and Liam go back quite a long way. We were involved in it with the bunch of people that innovated various forms of civil disobedience with a number of campaigns before Extinction Rebellion. We were involved in something called Stop Killing Londoners, which was an anti-pollution campaign in London. And we both worked closely on that, which involves blocking roads and having discos and various sort of peculiar things. So that's where we sort of cut our teeth in terms of what it means to break the law in a constructive way. Uh, and, and then we both progressed onto the Extinction Rebellion um, founding which was when April 2018 and uh, we both worked quite closely on the mobilization side of it and, and promoting it and um, I can talk more about the mobilization I suppose at the end but the upshot of it is is we worked together on blocking of the five, five, five bridges I was very involved in talking to the police and um, sort of organising where they were at and what they'd allow us to do and what they wouldn't allow us to do. And, and then we were both very much involved in the design process for April and trying to work out with quite a lot of stress what could happen and what might not happen. Um, so of, often people look back on things and think it was really obvious, but at the time, of course, we we're all sweating quite a lot. <laughs> Try and work out, you know, what the best thing to do was. But uh, it was always a joy to work with Liam and we're both pretty calm people. So uh, we sort of worked out a way of doing it, which did happen to work, which is useful. So I don't know, Liam, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, Liam, do you want to just give your perspective? I mean, were you part of Rising Up as well? Or what, like, what, what point did you come into the process? And, and what was it like? Yeah, so, I'm trying to get a flavour of it. Yeah, so I've got, I've got a background working in other kind of campaigns in London, you know, things like sorting out housing in my borough and healthcare in my mm. borough. Um, and it was around the Paris and the build-up to Paris that I kind of said, well, none of that is going to be relevant if we're fucked with what's going on with the climate. Yeah. Um, and so I, I wanted to do something about that in London, where I'm, where I'm from. And so I started looking for people doing something about air pollution. And that's when I got put in touch with Roger. And um, yeah, I think really, yeah, what we were, as Roger said, what we were doing was just testing out stuff that, you know, has already been tried. It wasn't anything new, but it was, it was doing it in a, in a slightly different way to what we'd seen in, in activism here in the UK in the previous, you know, 10 years or so. Um, and yeah, one of the main things was how do we make sure that even with a small group of people, we can use disruption, but also creativity to make sure that we get this, you know, outside of that cl clique or bubble of lefty activism and actually get our message straight into the media. So, you know, simply by, rather than just, you know, going and going and spray painting about air pollution, we had, you know, we had all the, we had like costumes made and all of this and all of these great like punchy symbols. And that was really where we started testing out stuff around the symbols mm -hmm. and how powerful they could be. 
and starting to break um, um, you know some of the taboos around what was acceptable to do in, in a protest mm. and and what was acceptable in the media so that's why you know even before we come on to April um, I think we around you know, the strategy at the beginning was these mass moments of civil disobedience where you've got the huge numbers of people taking a low legal risk and being disruptive through their sheer numbers. But often before those events, we have these kind of like taboo actions or you could just call them sort of like, but they're just a bit, they're a bit silly. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so well, the, the, the one before here? the bridge is... The one before the bridges was obviously just having the huge, our first big banners didn't say rebel for life as much as some people wanted it to. It said climate change, we're fucked. Mm -hmm. And so most of the, the morning papers had to censor half the banner, um, but they all printed it, censored. And, you know, before a few weeks before April, we had people stripped naked in the Houses of Parliament. And again, the, the media lapped it up, censored out the images, and yeah, it's about like bringing these sort of like, you know, something serious but silly that that is can be done by a smaller group of people just before these m larger mass events. I think is something that yeah, so we were kind of learned from those early reactions. The one in Parliament Sorry, you heard that. about on the radio in in Melbourne. So that was where that was the elephant in the room, right? semi-naked yep. people and, and the guy with the elephant ears, painted grey. Exactly. Exactly. And they were calling out something like, um, something like it was Brexit, wasn't it? It's something like, you, you, you're, not, you're not listening to us, we're going to die. It was something like that, I think, in, in, in the midst of a Brexit debate. It was yep. quite extraordinary. I think only it was about 13 rebels or something, and yet it got all the way around the world to Australia. Exactly. It got that spike of interest just before it kind of, I think it sparked people's inner rebel just before we were inviting them all to come down onto the street. Mm. With us. Do you have any other favourite ones, Liam, that, that had that, that atmosphere of daring? Um, I mean, yeah, all, all sorts of things. But, um, you know, we it was all about making our own timeline and putting putting stuff in, you know, bringing stuff to the seat of power. So rather than the last 10 years in the UK, we've seen an amazing effort of people against fracking here. And yet uh, politicians have felt it acceptable to completely ignore it, to not even go and see what's going on at the fracking sites. Um, to You know, the media have not reported on it. And so we took a bunch of people who live... Um, around some of the fracking sites and brought them to, you know, the seat of power to the, the office and the minister's office that's dealing with fracking and, you know, locked on outside, glued shut the doors. We thought it would all be over in, you know, an hour or something. We hadn't really, you know, no one had really prepared nappies or anything. Uh, but we got so, so much media there all of a sudden because we, so, suddenly we were actually there around the corner from the headquarters of a lot of the media in front of the MPs offices. And so the police didn't want to touch us because there was all this media until, um, until it started hailing and people kind of gave up of blocking the offices and like ran out with their lock-ons into the road and started blocking the roads. And then that sort of escalated it. And then someone else said, oh, I want to do better than that. So then we boasted them up on top of the front of the offices. And that's when, you know, Gail, spray painted the office as well and so it was it was all this like continued like creative escalation and all in the midst of the action because we just didn't know what it what was there was response was going to be what was going to happen would it take us through like that that action is obviously developing moment by moment how is that decided are you getting together in little clusters and sort of deciding or is a couple of people just really leading it and did you say you glued the doors shut at the start i hadn't heard about this would you, glue, you glued onto them? Yeah, so, the, yeah, so the, that was one of, after the declaration, our first action in the first week of action, this is leading up to the blocking of five bridges. This is way before April. Mm. Um, yeah, we just glued, we had had people glue, glue onto the doors of 
the office responsible for fracking. Ah, oh, okay. Um, and that was the that was the main part of the action. And mm. there was a mass of supporters, kind of supporting that. Um, and and we thought that okay, we'll do that. That'll be over in a, in a bit. And kind of we were there and they and there and it was like getting on for three, four, five hours. And you know, people just them, themselves were like, okay, well, we need to escalate this. This is not just about coming and standing outside with a banner. This is about this is an emergency, and so I'm willing to be arrested. So one one group of people blocked on when the police weren't paying attention, moved out into the main road and blocked the traffic. And then you know, the other group were like, well, we need to we need to do something to that level as well. You know, so people were just there responding creatively themselves and going. And then all of a sudden, someone realized that, you know, there were, the security were no longer paying attention to the front of the building. So we saw our chance and we quickly, you know, made like we were tying our shoelace and then boosted someone up, which happened to be Gail Bradbrook with a spray can. And, you know. Yeah, yeah and then I, we got I, that amazing picture. Roger, just, just um, it'd be really good if you would elaborate maybe at this point about this central strategy that you know it's different from just going and stopping this coal mine stopping this gas mine you know protecting this forest oh, yeah. it's about going to the center of the city and actually shutting it down but it's also about i mean i, I imagine while this was going on as well you and gail and various people were traveling all around the countryside doing introductory talks and building towards well first of all november and then later on april so do you want to just yeah just briefly yeah sum up that whole yeah i mean thing? the big the big innovation, and as I've said, we're not, this wasn't discovered by us. We're just repeating what has happened in the 20th century many, many times, and in the global south many times, and, and you know, including quite recently. And, and the, the main strategic point here is when you're dealing with entrenched power, um, you need the force of mass participation, civil disobedience. That's the primary historical mechanism through which uh, rapid political change happens in a progressive way. So, you know, that's point one. So the, the issue, I guess, is there have been some examples of that in Western democracies, but what we decided was that it was possible to engage enough people to take part in low level civil disobedience, uh, and that this was going to be primary mechanism to get it into public debate and get politicians to listen. And um, the reason for going to cities rather than coal mines or what have you, is that it's in the central cities and obviously in the capital cities or in Australia, maybe the state capitals, well, that's where three key groups are. First of all, the government. It's the government that makes, makes the rules of society. So that's got to be a primary focus, but also it's where the media is. The media doesn't tend to bother very much if you do something on the periphery, because if you're on their doorstep, you know, that's a big thing. And thirdly, that's where the elites are, you know, the governmental elites, the business elites and what have you. So in other words, you're taking it and pushing it in their face. You know, this is not going to happen on our watch. We're not going to betray the next generation. So there's that sort of determination by a mass of people to take it to the seat of power, literally. Um, so that's that's one element in it. Obviously, the other element is to do it with lots of people. And as you said, uh, Jane, this wasn't just a matter of, you know, put a, a Facebook page advert up or something, event up and expect people to come along. It was the process of six to nine months, depending, well, with April, like, yeah, nine months of, of systematic mass mobilization. In other words, going around the country, doing the Heading for Extinction talk, you know, dozens of times in every town and city in the UK and setting up groups and getting people trained in nonviolent direct action, uh, setting up affinity groups and then organising the logistics. And none of that happens without having quite a big machine, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's complicated and it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of boring everyday sort of administration and logistics and what have you. Um, but that's what, it, that's what it takes to get 10,000 people into, into a city centre. And um, yeah, it requires quite a lot of, 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 um, of organisation. 
The, oh, the other thing to say mm -hmm. is I think, so there's just to summarize here, there's two elements. So the one element is lots of people doing low level civil disobedience. And then the other element is, as, as Liam has said, is doing high powered, small actions, which really break taboos. And so that's the other challenge is, you know, the, the climate movement really has been quite tame, historically speaking. And what me and Liam have been helping to pr produce is is actions which really break you know shock people um and you know we all know what shocks people it's just a matter of having the courage to do it so again not everyone's going to do that sort of action but some people are so it's a matter of you know putting out the feelers for people that will take their clothes off or will climb on buildings or whatever it is and and then saying to those people okay so we're going to do these more dramatic actions which break the taboos in combination with this mass civil disobedience. Mm. So I think that's the general framework for, for April anyway. So look, somewhere along the way, you managed to get an office. And I did hear, I don't know, one comment, I don't know if it was right, but you had 80 people in the office working on April. I don't know. Is that true? Like, at what point did you start to get that big? I'm guessing it wasn't back in November when you launched, but it was still smallish then. Well, it was, yeah, you must it was have grown actually, massively before April to get up to those numbers. As, as, Roger, as Roger said, there was talks all around the country before any of that happened. Um, but then with, with the, the spike just before the declaration, suddenly we had a, had a non-linear moment just before the declaration. And so the declaration was bigger than we thought it would be. And so um, suddenly we, we, our original plan for the declaration was designed for a really small group of people. Mm. Um, and so we couldn't do that action anymore and suddenly we were at, without an action and so a small group of us decided that we should we should lock on outside Parliament to make sure that there was still some arrestable part to the, our declaration of rebellion because that's a key part of our strategy mm. and so um, yeah after as Roger said after months of you know calling around people after the talk going you came to our talk what do you want to do um, finally, I was lying on the tarmac and it's just like that sense of relief that now I know that for the next 12 hours I'm in the police's hands. So it's, it's, all, it's all great. And obviously I, I got out, went to the pub, um, found out that, you know, that day our um, online, you know, interaction had gone up 200%. Um, suddenly a lot of the people that we were talking to were like, okay, these guys are serious. I'm going to get involved or I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. And I think Roger said to me in the pub after I got out of the police cell, right, we need an office. <laughs> and so within about four days of the declaration, we had an office because that was just the, the, the pace and the energy. It was one of these moments of the whirlwind, a bit like April ended up being, that there was just interaction, you know, and we ended up getting a massive discount on an office in mm -hmm. central London just because you know, people, people did start to realise that this was something that was going to affect their kids' future at that point. And so that was the start. Why, do you have an explanation for why you'd got that spike just before November? Like November was, is what you're talking about with the declaration, right? With the five bridges? Do you have any idea why yeah. you got that spike of interest sort of before you'd even done it? Why it was bigger than you thought? Well, we got our first national, we got our first national article about a week before the declaration of rebellion from George right. Monbiot. Um, okay. So that was a small spike, but enough to do our declaration. And then obviously we did some of these actions like dropping a banner saying climate change, we're fucked. Mm -hmm. And then a few days later, then we had the the five bridges, block, shutting down five bridges in mm -hmm. November. But we got the office just before that. Okay. Yeah. So and then obviously I, I, by the time we got, to, but that was still a very tiny room that was gradually getting more and more okay. crammed with pots of hummus and ac activists on sitting on the floor. So then it was, it was kind of after, after the five bridges that we moved, we've managed to get an even bigger office for even less money. Cause again, <laughs> people just started to believe in, in something needing to happen. Okay. Yeah. So maybe I'll yeah. just ask Roger about the build up now to April, like, you know, how were you creating this whirlwind? How was the momentum being built? How was this excitement happening? 
Well, I, I think one of the things to, to understand about how this process goes is you, you, you mobilize through doing actions. <clears throat> In other words, like you have to do something dramatic and you have to have lots of people doing it. And then that's what inspires people's imaginations. You know, for every two or three people involved in the climate movement, there's probably another 20 that are waiting to get involved, but they want to see something exciting and attractive. And most of all, something that looks viable in terms of bringing about social change. And what I think November did was open up the possibility of actually getting somewhere for the first time in 20 or 30 years. You know, no disrespect to all the other amazing things that happened. It was more like the audacity of closing five bridges. And what, what I think it's important to understand is before we closed those five bridges, there was no guarantee we were going to get on them. We took a big risk, you know, and this is where we were sweating as it were, because I was going, yeah, yeah, I think we're at 80% certain to be able to get onto those five bridges. I didn't really know for certain, but if there's a climate emergency, this is, this is the point, right? Is you take a risk, and then you times that risk by 10, and that puts you in the ballpark of what we need to do to, to change you know, the, the weather of, of, of national debate about the climate. You have to be massively ambitious and massively risk-taking. And that's not because you're mad, it's because that's the only way it's going to happen, right? There's no, there's, the place for conservatism has gone, because conservatism now just means failure. You know, that's, you know, that's, that's the a main thing to understand about the sort of people we are. <laughs> and, and once, once you sort of pierce that sort of cynicism and apathy, then lots of people come forward. And that's how we got the office. We got an office for like about a quarter of the market price. And to give you an idea of what it takes to organize, say, a 10,000 person rebellion, you know, figures are important, I think. You need 10 or 15 people working effectively full time on media and messaging. You probably need 40 or 50 people working effectively full time on mobilizing people, doing talks. You need 10 or 15 people coordinating the whole, the whole thing. You need, you know, 10 or 15 people doing logistics, you know, regenerative culture, training. That, that's the sort of size. So if you add all those up together, you know, in, in the weeks, two or three weeks before April, yeah, we did have about 80 people uh, working full time. And, and the way we got that is by headhunting, as far as I was concerned anyway, is, you know, you're in a meeting and you can tell someone's got their head screwed on and they're desperate to make, make a difference. And you go up to them and you say, you know, hi, hi Jane, you know, do you want to do this? You know, do you want to give up your job? You know, that's what I did. I went up to people and asked them to give up their job because I don't care. You know, they can always say no. But this is the level of commitment that's needed, right? You, as I said, you can't produce something like April and all the razzmatazz of it without having, you know, maybe 100, 150 people involved in a fairly part-time or full-time capacity. So, um, and there's also like a, a, an action group and that's where we made those critical decisions with April of, of going to five sites. And again, you know, this it might seem obvious in retrospect, but at the time it was a massive risk because me and Liam and about six or seven other people that have got experience of designing actions, we we're all shitting ourselves because we were thinking, what happens if we don't get on the sites? You know, maybe we should just go for one site. But the sort of genius of our decision, as I see it, was to make that, take that massive risk of saying, actually, we're going to go for five sites and close down a global city, you know, for two, you know, one or two weeks. And we're just going to take that risk. And obviously, that's what got us into the international news. If we'd only just taken one site, then, you know, it would just have been another, you know, quite interesting protest, right? The fact that we had five sites and we held those effectively for 10 days because the police and the authorities were just overwhelmed with our audacity, basically. They, you know, that's what made it the massive success that it is. So, you know, but there was no guarantee, right? I mean, we got, we had quite heated discussions about it because we didn't want to have an egg on our face because we could have not got on those sites in the first morning and then everyone would have been saying, 
oh well that that was a bit of a rubbish idea you know so you just have to be able to um you know cope with the prospect of failure if you see what i mean um I but you know it's, it's in that ballpark sorry um, because i I mean, you're saying you, you really needed quite a large number, but I know you also had that thing of the living allowances, living expenses. So like, it seems like that was probably quite important in allowing you know, in really freeing those people up to commit to, to close to full time. So I, I just, yeah, well, I, well, I've got you, yeah, I, I might get Liam to comment on it too. Like maybe to do the living expenses. But also yeah, yeah, well. But really go take us through that, you know, you told the police in advance about these five locations. How on earth did you get on the road? So I'll give you a little bit more of a go, Roger, and then maybe swap over to Liam and tell some of the story. Yeah, I'll do VLE and mm -hmm. Liam do, does the police then. Okay, okay. so <laughs> voluntary living expenses is a major innovation because historically, you know, and over the last 30 years, you, you tend to have this big cliff edge thing. You either have people working for free, in which case they're really knackered and it's quite exclusive over middle class people can do it or people that are retired. Or you have this NGO model where you've got someone on 50,000 a year or something and, you know, it's very corporate and what have you. So what we innovated was this idea of, look, we've got 50 or 100 people. They're, they're madly keen on working full time. But, you know, a lot of them are young. Someone's got to pay their rent. Someone's got to pay their food to eat. So why don't we just give them like 200 pounds a week for voluntary living expenses? And what that means is, you know, obviously we did get quite a lot of money because, you know, we, we created this big splash in November, but also it meant the money went a lot further and we could have 50 or 100 people getting a small amount of money just so they can live, basically, so they can do what they, you know, they're being called to do, which is to work 70 hours a week or whatever it is to make this thing happen. Because there's an enormous amount of dedication out there, as I'm sure there is in Australia, right? This isn't just some run of the mill campaign, is it? This is life and death. Uh, so there's lots of people coming forward. And, and that's how we did, that's how we levered people from, you know, poorer backgrounds or younger people that just couldn't afford to do this work if they didn't have that bit of financial help. Mm. And um, so, but we shouldn't confuse that with, you know, turning into some big corporate, you know, money thing, mm. which obviously we're not. But uh, yeah, so that was that. And yeah, Liam can talk about the police. <laughs> before, we, before we go to Liam, just one more thing. Because you had a pledge system, didn't you? I know we talked to Ender Galenda recently and they said they made a point of not using a pledge system. They didn't want to you know, have people publicly committing to risking arrest. But I think you did have a, ple a, a pledge system. So, the, you know, you, you knew who had pledged to risk arrest. Is that right? Do you, I don't know whether you want to do that, Roger or Liam. Liam, maybe swap to Liam. Liam, Liam yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we had something, but it really did, it really wasn't everything and it was, it really was a small part of it, I think. Mm. Um, like another example, I think that's another example of where we really didn't know what was going to happen. I think if we went on our, you know, our spreadsheets and our data, you know, even a week before the numbers were like still in the hundreds before April that we actually knew were coming you know, on like in hard, hard data. So, you know, I think there was, there was some things, ways that we were recording who was going to come or what they were going to do, but we didn't really know. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, again, this was like, this was, yeah, a group of people that, you know, really cared about what was happening. They, you know, they were just really scared about the climate emergency and they were willing to do anything and take that, take an experiment and and be detached from the outcome um and not you know this wasn't about yeah whether we were going to do the, the the best protest it was about we got to do something and we got to try it and you know we're going to come down from wherever we are in the country you know there was those 80 people in the office but there was also all of these people who were taking mvda trainings around the country and forming themselves into affinity groups and saying to their friends or you know their people in their local group yeah let's go together let's go and do this and though and the one of the key things there was those you know we had a we had a group coordinating those affinity groups and trying to make sure we got some kind of even spread around the sites but again with the, we only knew about some of the people coming we, there was loads of people that just showed up that we never had the data on um, 
but the key message for those people just showing up and for those affinity groups was just show up to this place and sit down in the road and it was just that beautiful mm -hmm. simple action design mm -hmm. um that you know came from some of the things before extinction rebellion and that that was that was the simplicity of it you know and be prepared to come for you know a while take a week off work meanwhile all of us who had experience of actions design in the uk and the police in the uk thought that you know there was no way we were going to get five sites down and there was probably no way that many of them were going to last the first night and you know in the end they all went down most of them lasted at least a week some of them into two weeks um and i think that's where you know we set out to do something that was seen as politically impossible and so that requires a sort of like impossible approach as well and so like the five bridges felt impossible april felt impossible but it was like it's worth trying mm. and i think that's where you know the discussions with the police comes in you people there is a thing disclaimer that obviously the there is, we do have a different legal system the police here are different from many other countries but people sometimes see how the police dealt with extinction rebellion and say oh well the police in the uk must be really easy to deal with or they're really mm. nice all the time you know there has been non-violent protests in the uk that have been met with police brutality that have been met with completely different treatment um so it's not that um you know any action you do in the uk is like the police just allow you to do it but the, just one just of the on that point, I just ask you, like how did you get on the road like if the police knew what the five sites were how did you get on the road well this one of the differences is that we did we've made it a really publicly clear that we're committed to non-violence um and so that public acknowledgement of that that being open about that um mm -hmm. changes things slightly and then we made it really publicly open in public knowledge and also directly saying this to the police that we've got we've got a lot of people who are willing to get arrested and so as soon as you tell the police you're willing to get arrested well that's the biggest thing that they've got hanging over your head right that's where like you've told them you're about to break the social contract and they're like shit what do we do mm. so if they know that the thing that they're hanging over your head the thing that they can get you to move on or get you to not step out in the road to do is something that you're actually quite that actually is quite good for you that's actually mm. like them helping you out in your campaign mm. they're like okay well what do we do and if you look at if you looked at the faces of the officers on the ground on the morning of april there was also this um disbelief or wonder in in the pulling off of the impossible i mean not only did they knew the they knew about these sites but they probably just as we did anyone with experience with large-scale actions in the uk both in the police and in the activist world probably thought that it wasn't going to go off on that monday morning right mm. and so there they were seeing it seeing it all happen and also in the in the back of their mind knowing that if they went in heavy and arrested us that could be a win for us as well and we could come back bigger and stronger right so that's why it's so important that, that those two things were out there really publicly from the start so people just turned up gathered in their little clusters and you know the logistics teams and the affinity group coordinators knew which how many roughly how many affinity groups we needed for each bit of road and they were sent there and they sat down and that had been you know designed in such a way that one 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 road would be left open to allow a truck or a or a boat to come in to just, the place well, on the on the boat like yeah. that obviously was something that needed a lot of creativity and just to even come up with the idea is quite extraordinary, but also some sort of plan to get it onto the road. I mean, the pink boat seemed to really help a lot with holding that intersection. Do you want to tell us something about the thinking that went into that, either Roger or Liam, which we have as best? Um, the yes, so I think also that's... just how you got it there into the road. We had terrible trouble with our pink boat. We never got it on. <laughs> we, we, they were trying to. Um, yeah, we had a lot of trouble with our pink boat. It was only a little. Yeah, I think this is an example of where you got the majority of people 
the action design is really simple, right? They're just turning up and sitting down in the road. And then you've got a group of creative um, action designers and logistics people who are going to bring in this inspiring visioning piece. Mm. And then the two of those work together that suddenly, rather than um, people just sit purely sitting in the road in this in central London and being beeped at by cars, suddenly they're like part of this this moment and this this vision and that you know their heads are become the sea that the boat is sailing on you know they they are suddenly beneath the water and london is sunk in a time of sea level rising all of these things that are meant to different people the pink vagina to some people you know suddenly they didn't just come come and sit on the road and get arrested they wanted to they wanted to come back and check if the boat was still there after they'd been arrested and it was and then they got arrested again you know because they weren't going to let it go um and i think it's a good example of extinction rebellion mobilized a whole load of people who'd, who'd never done any kind of activism before and that in some ways allows for that a bit more of that impossible mm. thinking mm. but they were working together with people who had done a lot of actions before mm. and a combination of of the the you know the ideas of of people who've done loads of actions before working together with these these new things and that collaboration i think led to led to things like like the pink boat and a and a balance of um yeah enough enough artists combined with the logistical people that could i could work out how how it could be done um I might just pause you there and, and just check with Andy and Violet whether there's questions that have come up already that would be good to put in at this point. Because I'm aware we haven't got to April, to August to October yet. We've got to we've got to keep moving. But are there some questions that would really suit coming in now? In April yet? Or should we move on, like you know, get a bit of broad sweep right through to October. Um, yeah, we've got a really good question here. What processes did you go through to design mass actions, gather different pictures? For example. In, oh, for example, gather, gathering different pictures, all in vote power or a small group to design it, something else. So, yeah, what, how did you design the mass actions? Yeah, for, for April, it was, a, it, was a really, it was a small group of people, a, a combination of artists, it was a small group of people that gradually expanded into more and more working groups. So you start with a small group of people, you know, and, and listing off all of the potential places that could be, could create the most disruption, but also um, be, give a great vision and give that like one picture to the press that we wanted um, and all of the options for things that we wanted in there. And in, in the end, we chose the locations and what went in them to mirror our, um, three demands right and that i think that was really important in april um but then as as that plan expands suddenly you need a team of people who are like going out sourcing all of the sound equipment you need a team of people that are going to get all of the toilets sorted out you need a food team you need so you know you start with a small group of people and then and then you form these teams for each part and they get they get control over that part you know the people thinking about the boat you know, didn't have anything to do with what food was going to be served, you know, that that's all, there's a team doing that and then they run with it and, you know, they all show up on the day and somehow it kind of muddled, muddled together. Yeah, I, th I think there's a, a two-step process here. There's a sort of central group that makes the decisions, which made the decisions fairly early on about what sites we were going to do. And this is one of the benefits of open civil disobedience, by the way, is that everyone knows where the sites are. And that means that then after that step one of, of having that central group making that strategic decision about what's going to be occupied and when, then the step two is each site has, starts having its own, its own sort of coordination group. And then from that coordination group, you get all the logistical working groups working off it like arts and food and logistics and, you know, police liaison. So it's basically a list, a standard list, as you might say, of the different working groups. And obviously they're semi-autonomous to get on with what they've got to do and other people don't need to worry about it. Uh, and they get together once a week, representatives from those working groups and tell each other what they're planning and take feedback and, and be coordinated. 
so that's you know that's the organizational structure of it broadly speaking that was a great question Violet. are there any others we should take at this point before we just move on at least get a bit of a view of october I think probably get on with October. Oh, sorry, everyone. Uh, maybe get on with October, and yeah, we'll see if other ones pop up. Okay, so we'll, try, we'll try and do October pretty pretty quickly, because I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of these hundred people we've got on the call are here because they've got a question, and so we don't want to cut them short for their the questions they particularly want to know the answers to. Um, maybe I'll just take you both in turn. I'm not sure who's best to do which bit, but just you know about so you had. I mean, um, yeah. Put COVID-19 to one side, what have we learned oh. from the just past global rebellion and what can we, um, what can the movement expect going forward, your thoughts? Mm. Uh, how about we leave that one till after, because that's definitely an after, an after October one, okay, Violet? We just, I think we'll do that at the end. But let's just, let's just get through October, because April went really well. Um, 11 days, I think, in the end. And then um, the declaration of an emergency, an environment and climate emergency. So we've got, I've got some, I can see some questions appearing in the chat where we want to get through October into the, and look at future planning. planning. How, how did it go between April and October? How did October go? And, and, and what does that tell us about where we need to go next? There you go, three questions. And, I don't know who's best to go first. Well, I, I can just, I'll just briefly talk about, you know, what happened between April and October. Um, in, in October, I was in prison, so <laughs> I'm gonna pass over to Liam on that one. Uh, but, um, um, you know, like one of the things to understand, I guess, is no one's really done a rebellion against the Western government for a good few decades. So, it's difficult to actually work out strategically where to go after April. And there was a lot of discussion around doing higher level actions, which I was involved with, with um, you know, flying toy drones at Heathrow and what have you. Uh, and then there was a lot of discussion around how we mobilize uh, and do something for October. But the upshot of it is, is that, you know, out of that, we did decide to do, to have a, um, we did uh, create a date and we did sort of up the mobilization process, you know, which was a, a lot more organized with a lot more people. But because we we're unsure about what we were doing and when, um, I, my analysis is we are a bit late getting going on, on organizing October, given that we, we, we had that momentum from, from April. Um, but I'm going to pass on to Liam to talk about how October was organised. Yeah, so um, I guess like it's just good to know that like none of these different weeks of actions could have happened without the one before. Like the, the bridges like inspired people in a way that they could come to April and consider branching out again. I think, um, you know, April got a lot of people who'd never been involved before interested in doing something. And it also, you know, emboldened a lot of affinity groups to try something even, you know, more disruptive and bigger. And I think, um, so suddenly it wasn't just local, it wasn't just affinity groups that were organizing different bits of it, but, um, you know, local, oh, we've got a screen sharing thing going Who's on. Doing that? Um, we've got- um, I'm really sorry. <laughs> we've got um local groups and regions now organizing um you know s whole sites and taking on different parts of like the actions um which was quite different from april um so suddenly we've got a lot more people and we've got um a lot more people taking on more active roles in organizing what's going to be happening and so instead of four or five sites, we've got 12 or 13 sites um, that are trying to land. But we've also got a quite similar approach to the main tactic from April, and we've got a police force that have 
you know, been hammered by the press over April, have had time, had months to think about how they dealt with April and have, you know, quite understandably realized that, you know, the effect of some of those large um, creative visioning objects like the pink boat had on both the rebels and the general public. And so their main um, approach to dealing with us was, okay, let's get rid of the objects. So rather than, you know, one by one arresting people, um, which was really slow in April and it, and gave us time to send more people to sites that were where arrests were happening and allow us to hold them for longer because there's a there's a limit to how many people they can arrest in one go right and we were capping that limit multiple times both in April and October I think we were um, they started taking out the objects straight away so they either they didn't let the objects come in in October or they took away our tents and all of these things and so that without those big images suddenly there's this there's this perception that we weren't there or we weren't as big but actually that we had much larger numbers spread across even more sites it's just we didn't have those those big like you know creative inspiring images that we got in april which allowed it to go go more viral online and you know around the international media and so i think that's where some of the different perception comes in the other thing is you've got these new people who heard about us in April who want to support, some of them want to do something daring like risk being arrested and some of them want to do the more supportive things and organize all these creative things. And so they're doing all of these, all of these things in, in the tents and in the, in the park. And it's like April, you know, in April we had people who wanted to do the really disruptive thing locked onto trucks. And we had people who wanted to do the art workshops or the regen workshops or the music. Um, doing that in different tents. But in April, they were all doing that on the same bit of road. They were all blocking that same bit of road for 12 days. Whereas by the time we got to October, the people who wanted to do the real disruption were like, okay, we want to do, we want to take down an airport. So they went off and took down, you know, an airport and someone climbed on top of a plane. Um, and we had the creative people who weren't quite there yet wanting to do their creative stuff you know, off the roads in the park and things. And neither of those groups ended up blocking the roads. And so we had loads of people doing loads of different things. But there was some way in April where we managed to create one space that could hold both the people who wanted to chain themselves to trucks and do, you know, a yoga meditation session all in that same bit of road in a way that we didn't do in, in October. There were so many different things going on in so many different places. So just following on from that, I mean, differences. what would your advice be? Because we've got a bit the same problem in Australia, right? Police all over the world saw April, right? So when we tried to block a bridge in Melbourne, um, well, we did block it, but they taped it all off and, and stopped people joining us, you know, after the start, whereas you had people coming and, you know, dancing to the music and things like that. We were going to do dancing and all that, but they blocked off everybody from joining us on the bridge. So, I mean, that whole thing of getting boats on, getting trucks on, um, got a lot harder basically after police all around the world saw what you did in April, right? And, and it sounds like you, 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 it was harder for you in October as well. What are the lessons? I mean, do we still keep going to the centre of the city, get as many people, block it off? Do we have I think we still need that beautiful simplicity for the majority, for the mass actions, we still need that beautiful simplicity of the majority of people all they're doing is going going to that you know that major junction in the capital yeah. city and sitting down that's all that's so beautifully simple mm. that i think it, it if you've got the numbers it does work i think one of the big learnings that we had from april was around um having multiple sites change you know how the police could could respond to it and how we could move our resources between these sites that yeah. allowed things to happen so that you know you always have this mix of people who are on a spectrum of how rebellious they want to be and and so by having these different sites the police had to focus their attention on one or the other and so then people who wanted to risk arrest could move to where the arrests were happening people who didn't want to risk arrest could move to the sites where the heat was wasn't turned up you know and people could move between them somehow but obviously you don't know how the police in your country are going to react. So you're going to have to think creatively mm. to 
your local, you know, legal situation about that. Yeah, Roger, um, do you want to just um, yeah, I think... touch on lessons from October, lessons from April, yeah. and then we'll just move into these questions. These we've got a whole list of questions gathered, ready, ready to roll. Yeah, I think the big sort of mindset change is from the idea of sort of traditional environmental symbolic action through to material struggle, right? The, these are two paradigms of change. And what we've had for two or three decades is the notion of doing symbolic stuff. In other words, it doesn't actually materially affect the opponent, you know, and often it looks great and what have you but the press gets tired of it and you come up with something else, you know, you have a different costume or you, you know, jump on a different building or whatever. And obviously that's all well and good. But if you want to bring about rapid political change in a society, the method of doing that is through material struggle. What that means is, I mean, it sounds a bit dramatic, but what that means is, is you clogging up the state's ability to look, to end your protest right this is what the civil resistance model means which has been you know done so often in the global south and what have you and i always say to people it's a lit you know people say well you've done october and you know that was interesting and let's try something different there isn't anything different that works and the analogy is i i think is between you know uh civil resistance and the labor strike right the labor strike has been going on since 1880 no one says, oh, labour strikes don't work, let's try something else. Everyone knows labour strikes do work because it, it increases the material costs to the employers or the bosses, right? And that's why it's done over and over and over again, because it's the most effective tactic. And if you want to change your regime, the most effective tactic is to go to the centre of the city and you stay there until the government like, is brought to the negotiating table or it collapses. And it's been done over and over and over again because th there's no answer to it, right? If 10,000 people go into the centre of Sydney, it doesn't really matter what the police do because, you know, if they let people sit in the road, that's fine. You're going to get loads of publicity. If they arrest everyone, then you're going to get loads of publicity. So the, 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 main, the main point here is about the simplicity of it and sort of I see the future sort of moving towards this more blunt acknowledgement that it's about people sitting in the road or standing in the road and obviously you want to have as much art and entertainment and you know glamour and sexiness as you can get but that's that's not the main point here the main point is like in October we were told by intelligence you know from the judiciary and what have you that if we'd have two and a half thousand arrests, then the police and the judicial system would have cracked and the government would have been forced into some negotiation. So this is the second thing to understand, particularly about October, there was 1800 arrests, right? And obviously this is a bit reductive in my view, but at the end of the day, this is, you know, this is how you win political struggle. It's a numbers game, you know, if you have a thousand workers go on strike, nothing happens. If you have 10,000, then you get invited into the room. So it's the same like with a government, you know, and if, if you have a certain number of people, and the exciting thing to understand is in Western democracies, largely because of austerity and neoliberalism, the, the, the security forces and the police are actually got very small material resources um, compared with the good old days, as you might say. So it doesn't, you, you don't need to have 50,000 people. You, you know, the interesting thing to understand is in April, the people that there was only about 1500 people that were putting themselves into a position of being arrested. And, you know, it was global news. So don't think you need tens and hundreds of thousands of people to do this. You basically need, you know, two or three thousand people that are dedicated enough to take, you know, one or two weeks off work and get arrested and be let out and go back and get arrested and be let out and go back. Right. And, you know, they're in these affinity groups groups which give them that support and and what have you so that's you know that's the plan so if you you know if you go into sydney or something and they decide to block off the square where you're going to go then it's no big deal right you just block the road leading up to the square you know and one of the i, I talked to the police like 
about eight times before April. So I sort of know, I know how the police work, is that, you know, they sort of know, if they know people are determined to block roads, they know there's nothing they can do about it. <laughs> you know, it's just going to happen. So, um, yeah, so that's, um, that's the thing to focus on, is the numbers, rather than, you know, all the razzmatazz, as you might say, which, okay. you know, is all good. Let's give all these people who've been patiently waiting to ask their questions, who've been voting questions up and down this list. Are you ready to go, Violet, with, with a few questions? Yeah, there's a couple here that um, are about media. And so I think it might be nice to just give a big broad overview of that. Mm -hmm. um, what's your um, opinion on dealing with media? So there's some about saying you've got quite disruptive interview tactics. And mm -hmm. you, how, do you, how do we, as Extinction Rebellion, change the media's opinion or how they mm -hmm. report? And how have we previously? Okay, so that's a, probably a Roger, Roger question. Um, Yes, we, part of the rising up and extinction rebellion plan was to look upon uh, interviews as a place of direct action. Now, having said that, it's quite scary doing direct action on the media. So um, I, in my view, my personal view is we haven't really pressed that button, though people have walked out of interviews and what have you, and people have obviously been quite robust. Um, and my view on looking at the media is 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 that we shouldn't focus on on trying to do things that the media are going to like the media are primarily controlled by the corporate agenda as we all know so the media are there to try and humiliate us belittle us you know turn us into entertainment you know scapegoat us um, make it look like we're just all a bunch of useless hippies or whatever, right? So when we go into interviews, we're going, as far as I'm concerned, we're going into a verbal battleground. And, and what we need to do is make absolutely clear what we want to talk about in our own terms. Uh, and that's the best we, we can do. The main form of communication in civil resistance is the actuality of mass resistance and mass arrest that's what brings people around and i think maybe because of the defeats of the last 30 years people over exaggerate the power of the media i think the media now has limited power because there's mass disillusionment in western societies and people don't actually listen to you know i mean the other thing is because of social media lots of people don't really miss listen to the mainstream press anyway what people are impressed about is the is the unavoidable fact of mass sacrifice and that's what creates those 10 million conversations around the dinner table as it were in in the homes of ordinary australians or ordinary british people and the conversation goes something like this you know i think that you know i think they're, they're they they look like idiots to me but at least they're doing something and at least they've got some guts right and that's the first step towards mass attitude change and once people start respecting, you know, um, calm, disciplined, mass civil disobedience, then they start actually attending to why you're engaging in sacrifice. And that's when people start going, actually, this climate crisis is real and the government should be doing something about it. Now, that's not going to happen overnight. I mean, it happened in a dramatic way in April. You know, before April, no one really cared about the, emergent, the climate emergency. They hadn't even heard of it. And after April, 67% of the British population uh, agreed there was a climate emergency and they wanted something to do about it. And now 55% of the British population are very concerned about climate. This is why, this is why uh, Extinction Rebellion was the number one influencer on the climate crisis globally in 2019. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is let's not get too hung up about a bad interview or a bad, bad headline. You know, it's, we have limited power over that. What we should focus on is making clear, you know, our absolute determination to peacefully break the law in the face of the catastrophe that we face. And, um, and I think just drawing on from that, what's important is that the people that speak to the media are ordinary people. 
you know, they're not professional activists. They're not um, pe the usual suspects. The people you want to talk to in the media are ordinary working class Australians or, you know, farmers or small business people. You know, all the people that are going to suffer and are suffering enormously already due to the catastrophe. And that that opens up the debate of going, hang on a minute, this isn't just an environmental situation. It's a situation about the future of the country, about the future of our families and our communities. And that's the framing battle, you know, um, which obviously is a big battle. <laughs> Do you want yeah. to comment briefly, Liam, before we move on to another question? You got any uh, let's make time for other questions. Let's okay, make... All right, Violet, what's next? Um, I am sorry to have to ask this question, but it's obviously the one on everybody's lips is strategically um, moving forward. What, what opportunities do we see coming out of um, the COVID situation and what does it mean um, in your mind um, uh, as um, to move forward with mass mobilization? I'm sorry. <laughs> you want to say something about that, Liam? Yeah. Um, I mean, we don't know, right? It's an experiment. We were we were experimenting with the situation we were in last April and last October, and now people are starting groups and people here in the UK are starting to experiment with what works and what doesn't work in the COVID situation. Like, we need to we need to make sure that we're not stopping, um, that we're continuing to experiment. But I do think um that it's i mean again obviously all of this is talking from our own opinions i think it's interesting right now to think about disruption and you know can can we disrupt can we be much more disruptive than what the how the coronavirus is disrupting the system right now um or how do we get out and and i think there are ways but we have to be creative um but also we have to acknowledge that you know, there there is some massive disruption happening already right now, and so, um, what what is that doing to the system? Um, yeah, where where is the strategic focus? And I think it is like Roger said, coming back to this being that beautiful simplicity of the strategic part of Extinction Rebellion. You know, um, I think one of the one of the privileges coming in early was choosing Extinction Rebellion as as one strate strategic part of a wider climate movement. And again, looking at how remembering the media has its own interest in how it portrays us, we've begun to be portrayed as, you know, the whole climate movement and people coming in have start, tried to make Extinction Rebellion everything and pulled that experiment in lots of different directions, I think. And I think right now, is a chance to pause and reflect and you know i've been i've been doing the dna strategy sessions to, in this time so that people can get their head around that core simple strategy and how we can stick to that part and put all of our our focus on you know where can we put our focus in this all of these areas of power and these important places to do work as extinction rebellion allow other parts of the climate movement to do their part and we put our focus here and and really make that difference yeah, I'll just mention two two sort of practical things because obviously, you know, the, there is a certain practicality problem with with uh, you know the coronavirus challenge. But I think two things that are starting to develop around the world, and particularly in the UK, is is that uh, heading for extinction talks are going online, and people are setting up groups, still setting up groups, but doing it online through Zoom and what have you. So this can happen and it is happening in some ways. It's easier because people don't have to get out of the house. They can just go into a Zoom call and hear about things. So that's one thing. And then I think what's developing around the world, as probably people have seen, is people are doing protests with social distancing. So the guys in Tel Aviv sort of beat us to it, I think, by doing, you know, I think two or three thousand people had a big civil disobedience event and everyone stood or sat uh, five metres apart from each other. So those two things, I, I guess, are the new experiments that we're moving towards. Uh, the slogan that's in the UK of no going back, I think is quite a good one. I think this idea that's sort of developing, that things have already changed so much in terms of, you know, material conditions. Things have already changed so much and there is actually no going back. Like it's not going to be possible to go back. So we're probably going to head into a period of great economic disruption, even, you know, if the virus is going. So I actually like that as a as a as a message that 
everything's changed already, now we've just got to make sure we keep going forward and don't go back. Well, we can't go back as well as we don't want to go back. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone quite knows what the six month, next six months is going to hold. So, you know, everything anyone says is, is sort of speculative. But there's a good case to be made that people have actually seen the impossible happen. They've seen an economy, you know, be closed down and change in a matter of weeks. So now, you know, from a psychological point of view, once people see something happen in actuality, they're far more willing to be able to envisage it happening again. And this is potentially a massively powerful argument for the climate emergency message, which is, well, we close down things for the climate emergency, for, you know, COVID, then yes, we can do the same. We can do the same. It is actually possible to save our children's lives if we have the courage and uh, to make that step and transition to a post-carbon economy, you know, in an emergency fashion. Yeah. So, you know, but obviously no one quite knows, but there's, as everyone knows, there's, there's, strong, there's a strong argument for that. And obviously people also are aware now that nature isn't some abstraction, right? Nature can come and get us and bring us to our deaths a lot sooner and quicker than we thought. We're not some invincible gods, right? Nature's there and, you know, climate change will have come and destroy our social life and our nations and our families if we don't uh, do what the scientists say needs to be done. So, you know, there's a rich, there's a rich lot of messaging there that's mm. going to be coming out in the next six months. But, you know, who knows what's going to happen? No one knows, right? But that comes back to, you know, what Liam's saying, is this is all about experimentation, right? It's all about risk taking and it's all about courage. It's, you know, if you're coming on this call wanting, you know, to know exactly what to do with a set result, then, you know, <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's not, that's not how the world ticks, you know, you yeah. know, it's, um, it's um, fortune rest with the brave and all that sort of thing. That's mm -hmm. what I'm saying. I'm seeing some comments going past in the chat. I mean, in, in Australia, we've had the drought, which was pretty catastrophic, going straight into the fires, which were completely catastrophic, going almost straight into the virus. So we do, uh, we are really getting the feeling of these rolling crises just unfolding and rolling into each other. But anyway, at least we've now really seen what emergency mode looks like, that we can just stop, completely change everything in a matter of weeks. But Violet, what's the next question? Have you got, got some more we can whip through? We've got, well, if we, if we go a little bit over, because we started a little bit over, we've still got, you know, 10 or 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, next question is about lock-on devices. So in Queensland, we here, we've had quite a big crackdown on lock-on devices. Um, and so I suppose I wanted to ask, in your experience, how important they are for being able to hold down a location? Um, and uh, yeah, any, any advice or fun stories about lock-on devices that you could share? Yeah, I, think, I don't think they're the most important thing. I think that's one, it's something that Extinction Rebellion has used, like, and obviously when you're doing these smaller, like, actions, maybe they come, they come into play and they, they have their place. But as we've been saying, there's the simple, the, the, the more simple you can keep it for the majority of people, um, the better. So when we're going to these nonviolent direct action trainings and doing them around the country, the key thing is, is how we can, how we can find the thing where, you know, you get like the lowest legal risks for people to take and the, the simplest thing that they don't need too much training to do. Um, but through sheer numbers, um, and just through the act itself creates the maximum disruption, both to the legal system through them being arrested and disrupting that system and to the, you know, the flow of traffic in London. So that's why just getting people to come and sit down in the road is the main thing. Um, but there are ways that, you know, uh, you know, a few people locked on can, um, you know, take the heat off the, off the, the mass crowd for a while because the police have to focus on that and deal with that situation um or you know i'm not really obviously i don't know what you mean by situations where you are so i don't i don't know exactly what you yeah what you're referring to but i think this is you know again going away from that space of like highly trained activists who know how to use all these different things to like, this is something that anyone can do. Um, 
and I think I think as I said in April there was a space for that diversity so there's the activists who you know knew what they were doing and wanted to lock themselves to to a truck could do that in the same space where the majority of people were just sitting down some of them were dancing some of them were in a workshop some of them were just you know sitting there um waiting to be arrested but they could do they could all cohabit that same action space yeah awesome thank you so much um, our next question is about affinity groups and um, the best way to keep them strong. Go on, Liam. I, Go on. Liam. <laughs> I was just going to say, I doubt, I doubt me and Roger are the best people to talk about that. We've been like, <laughs> it's like probably busy getting our, getting our head down, stuck into the like mass mobilizing and, and organizing things rather than having time to be in, be in an affinity group. But there are some really great affinity groups that are still together, you know, since, that, since the very first actions of Extinction Rebellion and they're still going out and doing stuff. And I think, I think something that Extinction Rebellion's done quite a lot, but I learned in actions before Extinction Rebellion is about keeping it fun. And, you know, it is about the main, the core of it is simple, but as we said, having those kind of fun, more creative elements does help inspire the rebels to continue continue doing it as well. And so I think some of the the affinity groups that have stayed together longest have come up with, you know, fun things that they want to do or, um, you know, and and been daring to experiment like the affinity group that went and got naked in parliament or people that went and um, painted the front of the Brazilian embassy, you know, they've been daring to experiment and do things together um, that were creative. Yeah, great. Thanks. Two more. More questions. Yeah, well, I think the next one will have to actually be for you, Jane. Um, it's the top rooted question, and it's um, what impact do you think the low density um, compared it to the UK to how we do civil disobedience here. So it's basically like um, the, you know, because they have a higher population density in the UK to what we do here, it's harder to bring everyone together. Um, do you think that that changes our strategy? Look, I think we need, the, the idea with this is, and I can see some people getting a bit impatient with it, is that we are really just doing the lessons from the UK. Um, next Monday, we're gonna do the lessons from the rest of Europe, Poland, Germany, France, every place we can gather together. And I think then we need just to give Australia respect and give us a whole hour to think, at least to think about which direction it is. But I mean, I think we had a pretty good plan for May, which was that we would have locked down as much of some of the large cities, large capital state, state capital cities for as long as we could, and then converge on Ca and Canberra for at least a few days afterwards. I think that was a good combo for at least, you know, those who can get to Canberra and it's not too ridiculously far away, but yeah. We have that problem that Canberra is the seat of government, but it's not really a business hub. So I think we've probably got to do a mixture of shutting down the state capitals and shutting down Canberra, especially the Parliament House bit, because it's really just not a business hub. There's not a lot of business to shut down. Okay, next question. Apparently there's two questions with the most numbers of votes that haven't got asked. Is that, can you see those? Yeah, so that was about the population density and oh. also um, the processes to design mass actions with which we covered both of those. Okay. Well, um, and the third in. one is about COVID restrictions going forward, which we already talked about. Yeah. Um, the, this one's an interesting question. Is there anything important strategically or tactically that you've changed your mind about? So we value reflecting mm -hmm. and learning. What have you learned? Um, probably get both well, I, to I, I, <laughs> I could say two, two two things that my I've orientated towards personally, I suppose, but also with other people. And the first thing is to just reiterate this idea that we need to focus on the fundamentals of political change rather than getting over involved and stressed around, you know, whether we take this roundabout or whether you know, that lock on works or, or or whatever. What we need to focus on is the major strategic point here, which is 
the more people that go to a city and sit down in that city, the more likely you'll hit that tipping point where the police get overwhelmed or decide that they aren't going to be continuing to arrest people day after day, week after week. And you get to that point where the government decides to come to the table. Now, that's never happened yet, but there's absolutely no reason why it won't and can't. So, and that leads on to the second sort of major reflection, I suppose, which is we really need to focus on mass mobilization because winning is all about those numbers at the end of the day. And the numbers is reliant upon hundreds of thousands of ordinary people, ordinary Australians going, the most important thing in my life now is the future of my children and the future of my community and the future of the country. And that, and what that means is if you're going to mass mobilize people, we need to get out of the bubble of environmental sort of demographics, you know, urban middle-class radical people. We need to get out into regional Australia, into normal communities in inverted commas, and give them that basic human message that whatever your cultural background, you know, wherever you've come from, no one wants to see the end of their children's lives, the end of their communities. And as Jane said, you know, there's plenty uh, on the minds of Australians, as I understand it now, uh, because so many horrendous things have happened. Um, and the way to do mass mobilisation is to systematically go through the population areas doing heading for extinction talk in each locality. You know, so for instance, in London last uh, last February, we divided London up into 32 boroughs and we set up 20 groups in four weeks, right? We just had a bunch of people and we went bang, 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 bang through them. So you want to take, you know, New South Wales or whatever and say, right, there's 50 boroughs in New South Wales, let's say for the sake of argument. And in the next two months, we're going to do a heading for extinction talk in every borough. So, you know, it just becomes a project like that. And in every borough in New South Wales, you have, have a group. And obviously, there's quite a lot of skill and complication around doing that, which is one of the reasons I'm doing work in Australia to help that process along with other people that have done it in the UK and in, in the US and what have you. So we, I, don't, I won't go into all the smaller details about it. But that's, you know, as with all, you know, mass movements, the, the real success is behind the scenes in the day to day grind, as it were, of stuffing the envelopes and, and getting on with the job, right? The sexy bits of, you know, locking on and being arrested and all those bits or, or whatever, they're just like the cherry on the pie or whatever it, the phrase is. The real work is done in those three months of, of you know, solid, solid organising, as you might say. Yeah. Okay, so Liam, I think the question was really to do with which, anything you've changed your mind on. Had a second, had second thoughts about. Um, not a lot, not a lot, really. To be honest, I think I think really I'm um, where I'm at now is really about um, bringing it back to that core that core strategy. I think like something that's become you know really clear is the is the simplicity of the actions. And the, simp and the simplicity of the demands and how useful that is. I think as more and more people have, as the media have portrayed as more and more as the whole climate movement and more and more people have like, rather than hoping that the science is going to fix it, they've kind of a bit hoped that Extinction Rebellion is going to fix it or something. Like this isn't, I mean, you know, we're barely, you know, barely able to like have the resources and the capacity to keep up with like going out and doing these heading for extinction talks, calling up people afterwards and saying, what are you going to do? How are you going to set up your local group? Suddenly people are hoping that we're going to like come up with the solution as well, you know, and that's really that our job isn't to do everything. Our job is to um, be focused and, you know, focus on this nonviolent mass civil disobedience moments and 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 you know pull them off with with more and more people um rather than yeah becoming a place for people that's that's inward facing you know for people who want to you know just debate about the solutions to climate change we need to reach 
the people that the climate emergency hasn't hasn't got out to yet and and keep going with that okay tell me me just take one more question Bob. have you got one more and yeah um this one make, make this the last one i guess because it's uh, getting past 7 30. is there a consensus across movements developing about climate action strategy is this something you could think we should focus on as in networks between orgs like networking between organisations, should we be making more friends? The, the movement of movements idea, probably. Yeah, do you want to yeah. hash that out, speak a little bit to it? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's been it's been interesting. Um, you know, we've had some diff very different reactions from different different movements over the over time, and as different things have happened, some people have kind of come round to see our part in that. I think the, you know, it's it's this this thing where extinction rebellion has its part and we're part of an ecology of theories of change right and it's really we're in this emergency right we're completely fucked and we don't actually know what's going to work obviously i've put my my you know my time my energy with this experiment of extinction rebellion because i think it's good enough and it's like it's it's a really good shot and i think we need as many people as possible to put our energy here but there's loads of other groups out there, right, with different theories of change that are heading the same way. And we don't know which one of those will work. And sometimes they work together. You know, these lawyers that are taking governments to court, you know, the results that they get in court are affected by the shift in public opinion and the acknowledgement of climate emergency that come from the mass protests. And we can't, we can't take the government to court and they can't go and lock onto a truck because they're lawyers, right? So, um, but all of these things can be working together. And whether whether or not you know we get on is sort of like another question and and I don't think our job is to worry about too much about being being liked all the time it's It's just to acknowledge that we have this strategy and they have theirs, and we need as many people as possible to be getting out and doing something and we need we need an even greater number of the population to just acknowledge the climate emergency and think it's key and so again, that is you know as we saw in after April a massive spike in people acknowledging the climate emergency. But, you know, the general public didn't necessarily love our tactics, but that didn't matter. Enough of them did and came back for October in, in bigger numbers. But the key thing is that now, you know, over 50% of the UK think that this is a major issue, right, as well. Yeah, I think, I think there's a big transition here or a big opportunity. And sorry, I'm sort of bang on this again is that the environmental movement, you know, traditionally, and particularly over the last 10 or 20 years, has got this idea we all need to work together and we'll have a push and we're going to succeed. Uh, but it's like, it's like arguing over the size of the pie rather than expanding the pie. And the proposition of Extinction Rebellion is there's 20, 30% of the population out there that if you go and give them the Heading for Extinction talk, if you go and tell them, like, the horrific science of what's going to happen, then those people will mobilize. So it's not just about the old demographics, not just about all the old movements, important as they are, of course. What, what the, the penny drop, dropping moment here is to realize that there's millions of ordinary people in, in our countries who are already shitting themselves about the climate, but they're not getting organized because no one's giving them a pathway to action, because no one's going to talk to them because the environmental movement generally just talks to itself, right? This is the big change. And, you know, I can sort of concretize this by saying like traditionally environmental movements and most movements, it's like if someone walks through the door at your meeting and they're like you, you go, oh, that's great. That's someone like me, right? That's the old attitude. The new attitude is someone walks through the door and they're not like you and you go, wow, that's great because they're not like me. In other words, the people we want to mobilize are the people that are not like us. Once you have those people, then you start building this mass mobilization, which as we've identified is the key determinant of structural political change in societies, when it becomes a mass movement, right? Rather than like a minority trying to, you know, organize itself against the majority, as you might say. Um, so, you know, that's the challenge. That's why I call professionalization <laughs> is when you want to work with people that you don't particularly like rather than work with people you do like. So that's the challenge as I see it.
So maybe we should round it off there and at least um, and in a minute finish off the Facebook Live and finish off the recording. And just before we do, I just really want to thank you both for your time. It is one of the advantages of COVID, just getting used to Zoom and being able to talk with wonderful people like you too, Roger and Liam from the UK. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of all the questions that haven't got asked. Um, but I just hope that we'll probably, we'll do it again some other time. Um, and, and have you as part of this conversation about how we move forward in Australia as soon as we can, which is pretty soon, I think, as the restrictions just to start to ease a bit. So, thank you. <laughs> you wanna yeah, well, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to just say, uh, I, I think on behalf of Liam as well, is we're really honoured to be asked to speak to you. And just to re-emphasize again that, you know, just our work is all an experiment, right? This isn't, you know, this isn't some God-given process. We all need to experiment in what we do. And it's quite possible we've got quite a lot of things wrong. I'm sure we have. And, you know, in so much as we're being invited to uh, be involved with the Australia situation, you know, we're just here to give advice, right? You're the guys that make the decision. It's the decentralized movement. And, you know, if you don't like something we say, then just ignore it <laughs> and uh, that's the relationship we want to have and you know that's the healthy relationship that we, we want so uh, thank you very much everyone and obviously we all wish you the, the best of luck at these in these dark times so yeah thanks yeah thank you so much and yeah solidarity it's amazing to see how much energy there is over there uh, there's heaps there's heaps and yeah we're very honored to be chatting with you and gathering the energy from your side as well. I really, I really think the virus is, like someone said, a portal, it's a doorway. Everything's going to be different. And I think it's great good fortune that Extinction Rebellion has come along to help us organise this magnificent self-organising system that can seize the moment. I, I think that, who knows, like, it's going to be surprising. But for now, go have your dinner. Relax. It's Saturday night. A special dedication points for tuning in on Saturday night or Saturday morning in your case. And um, we'll see you soon, Rebels. Thank you. Oh, hey, do you want to just, just do a cheer? Okay. Turn on, turn, unmute everybody. Yeah, unmute everyone. Unmute everybody. Um, hang on, I'll just, I'll just um, make sure everybody and as many people as I can. And we're going to go, are you ready? We're going to go, extinction! 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 That's all right, we're going to go, extinction! Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night, Rebels. Thank you, Liam and Rachel. Oh, look at all the faces I can see. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Alice.